When we ended things last time, the Vault Dweller and their Overseer had learned that in the years before the bombs dropped, the American government had secretly relocated the gold reserve from Fort Knox to a hidden vault tech vault north of Berkeley Springs, West Virginia. Though it had once been intended to serve as the heart of a post-war economy, the hoard of wealth remained locked away behind the great door of Vault 79. The Overseer wanted to kickstart the government's original plan, but to do so she had to get into the vault, and that was not something she or the Vault Dweller could do on their own. They needed help from the settlers of Foundation. In visiting with the settler leader, the Vault Dweller had received a commitment to discuss a raid on the vault if they could provide a means of entry. Remembering an autonomous drill they had discovered on a previous trip to Charleston, the Vault Dweller had a plan. I'm the Resolute Cartographer, and this is part four of the story of the Settlers of Foundation. The Vault Dweller departed Foundation for Hornret Industrial's headquarters in Charleston. They had visited the site before, and it was on one of those visits that they had learned the story of Hornwright Industrial and their amazing motherload drill. For generations, Hornwright Industrial and Garahan Mining had been the two great family-owned mining corporations of Appalachia. Thanks to their great size and wealth, these two families employed most of the miners in the region, leaving just a few mines here and there run by smaller outfits. These corporations not only mined the minerals, but they also developed new technologies to make their miners more efficient. Though over the years, the development of these technologies had led to a need for a smaller and smaller workforce, both corporations recognized the importance of keeping high quality, effective miners on staff. That mindset came to an end with the rise of Daniel Hornwright to the position of CEO of Hornwright Industrial. While Daniel's father had said, your products are only as good as the people who build them, Daniel believed that automated labor was the future and he was going to prepare for that future. It was with this mindset that he collaborated with Robco on the production of the Auto Miner, a Protectron variant made specifically to replace human miners. The auto miner proved to be a massive success, easily removing humans from the actual work of mining. This isn't to say that every human working for Hornwright Industrial was out of a job, they still needed people to maintain the auto miners and ship the already mined materials out, but Daniel had those workers in his sights as well as he planned to automate every job in the company by 2100. When his auto miners faced their first real threat, he was ready to fight that challenge with every available option. The challenge was quite literal in this case, the man versus machine event. Vivian Garahan, the CEO of Garahan Mining at the time, wanted to do everything she could to save the jobs of human miners. The problem was, auto miners were better at mining. Her solution? The Excavator Power Armor, a civilian version of the power armor the army was using to make great gains in the war with China. Human miners were more mentally competent and flexible than auto miners, they just didn't have the strength and endurance to match them. She hoped the excavator power armor would give human miners the edge they needed to beat the machines. She hired a military expert in the construction of power armor and devoted massive resources to the task. She then challenged Hornwright Industrial to the man versus machine event, a 24 hour mining battle that pitted a team of Hornwright's auto miners against a team of Garahan's human miners and excavator power armor. Daniel wasn't going to leave the outcome of this event up to chance, so he dispatched his vice president of corporate engagement, Dush Wharton, to make sure the auto miners came out on top. Garahan Mining found themselves the victims of sabotage. Generators were disconnected, fires were started in filing cabinets. Hornet Industrial even managed to get their hands on a full set of schematics on the excavator power armor. In the end, Hornwright's auto miners won, and Garahan was effectively shamed into leasing auto miners from Hornwright to make up for the lost resources spent on the excavator power armor. Not content with simply automating away all mining jobs in Appalachia, Daniel Hornwright set about automating the entire government of the state of West Virginia. Ballot Measure 6, also known as the Appalachian Prosperity Act, would replace all government workers over 10 years. Daniel was a big booster of this plan, which isn't at all surprising when you consider that the state would be purchasing a lot of equipment from Hornwright Industrial along the way. When Senator Sam Blackwell challenged the measure as it would eliminate thousands of jobs, Daniel Hornwright sicked his fixer, Harper Rosiak, on the senator. By threatening the senator's daughter's life, Rosiak managed to scare him into hiding, removing the last real roadblock to the APA. As anti-automation protests continued to build against Hornwright Industrial, Mr. Hornwright took new approaches to the problem. When protesters went home for the day, he purchased more land, moving the property line back so that those protesters could be arrested for trespassing when they showed up again the next day. 
He had two protesters that threw tomatoes at his daughter's limousine arrested for assault. When Hornrat's strike breakers refused to remove striking workers from his property, he teamed with Robco to create a force of robotic strike breakers. Even the anti-labor force was automated out of a job. The culmination of Daniel Hornwright's efforts in mining and automation was to be the Motherload Project. Originally, it seems that this project was a multi-platform operation. Having learned of the existence of vertebrates from his contacts in the Defense Department, Daniel came up with an idea of a vertebrate with ore detection capabilities that would direct mining operations. Whether or not this ore detection technology was stolen from Garahan, we'll probably never know. Regardless, in the end, Daniel Hornwright decided upon a single platform to accomplish his dreams of a fully automated mining operation. He devoted the entirety of his personal team of researchers to the project. Jose Bragada came up with the first designs, combining the company's expertise in drilling technology, ore detection, and automation. These motherload machines would tunnel through the earth searching for ore, mine the ore, and return it to Hornwright Industrial without any human input. After a time, Mr. Hornwright even poached a young researcher from Atomic Mining Services' Electronic Intelligence Division, whom he introduced to his skeptical team as the future of mining as we know it. Though they didn't believe that this young woman with only one PhD from a state school would be a worthy contributor, she ended up making all the difference. In just four weeks, she managed to solve three outstanding issues on the project, and even provided the machine with an in-field self-repair system that was able to operate without interrupting the machine's operations. The team continued working to improve the systems of the mother load without direct supervision until late summer 2077. That August, Evelyn Hornwright, Daniel's wife, passed away after a long battle with cancer. In the aftermath of this terrible event, Daniel threw himself into the mother load project to avoid being broken by grief. Over the next two months, he worked on the project incessantly, avoiding everything else. When vague rumors of the project spread and Charleston Herald reporter Bill Breyer showed up asking what the Motherload project was, Daniel became paranoid. He believed one of his researchers had been leaking information. Though turned away empty-handed, Breyer attempted to infiltrate a Hornwright testing site and was shot by security for his trouble. When a member of the PR department came to Mr. Hornwright concerned with how this would be viewed, Daniel fired the man on the spot. He had grown to despise what he saw as weakness in his executives. In his journal, he simply noted that he wished his security team had been robotic, as they wouldn't have needlessly shot the man. One who has experienced robotic security might be excused for thinking that robotic security would have been more likely to shoot. Regardless, when labor riots that bordered on open rebellion took place in southern Appalachia, Daniel saw it as further confirmation that his mother load was a vital technology to eliminate human labor from his company. By late October 2077, the mother loads were practically ready to go. Unfortunately for Daniel, the completion of his magnum opus also coincided with the end of the world. In the aftermath of the bombs, the Hornwrights had disappeared, leaving four mother load robots behind to wander subterranean Appalachia. The Vault Dweller had met one of these four on their last visit to Hornwright Industrial, when they had accessed a subterranean testing chamber and helped it to repair itself. Upon reaching that chamber again, the Vault Dweller attempted to summon the massive drill to them, only to learn that the machine was heading for a new signal. A new signal originating from the Hornwright State Safe Room. Thanks to the Vault Dweller's previous trips to the Hornwright HQ, they already had a key to the estate, and had made use of it in the past. They departed immediately for the old Hornwright estate in Brommel, to determine the origin of the signal now pursued by the mother load. Upon arriving at the Hornwright estate, the vault dweller discovered that the elevator now not only ascended to the estate, but also descended to a heretofore unknown safe room. Unfortunately, their key card to the estate in general didn't match the safe room specifically. Thus, they rode the elevator up to the residential section of the estate and began the search for proper credentials. After a thorough search of the site, battling security robots all along the way, they finally found the means to print a new copy of the necessary keycard in the room that had belonged to Daniel Hornwright's daughter, Penelope. From what the Vault Dweller had learned of Penelope Hornwright, they knew she was an impressive woman. She had attended VTU, where she double majored in business administration and geological science. Over the summers of her junior and senior years, she had interned with Hornwright Industrial and Atomic Mining Services. In 2070, she graduated VTU summa cum laude and went to work for Hornwright Industrial. Though she may have gained her position through nepotism, she was certainly equal to the tasks of her role, and she worked hard, providing excellent value to the company. When her mother, Evelyn Hornwright, passed away, Penelope was sad, but she had accepted her death well before it came. 
and in fact was happy that her mother was no longer living a life connected to a bunch of machines. Seeing her father grow more reclusive and paranoid in the Motherload project, she was concerned. Not just for him, but because his pet project, about which she knew very little, was eating up their operating capital. She effectively ran the company through this time and steered Hornwright Industrial through the chaos of the October riots. When it came to printing the keycard on Penelope's computer, the Vault Dweller found that they needed to enter the right code. In the end, the code happened to be the date of Evelyn Hornwright's death, August 23rd, 2077. With a new keycard in hand, the Vault Dweller descended into the depths of Hornwright's mansion, seeking after one of the family's most impressive creations. When they exited the elevator and opened the safe room with their newly acquired keycard, the Vault Dweller found themselves face to face not only with the Motherlode, but with Penelope Hornwright. The Vault Dweller soon learned that in the aftermath of the war, Penelope Hornwright fled Appalachia and lived a nomadic life with her family. Sometime around 2083 to 2084, she gave birth to a daughter. The Vault Dweller had known that despite the rivalry with Garahan Mining, Penelope Hornwright had been in love with Bryce Garahan, the son of the CEO and the heir apparent. Regardless of whether this child was a product of that union or not, wandering the wasteland of post-apocalyptic America was no way to raise a child. And thus, Penelope looked for a safe place for her little girl. When the family came across a vault with a malfunctioning door, Penelope thought she had found the perfect place to safely raise a child. She made a deal with the vault dwellers. She would fix their door and they would let her family join them within. When she realized that holding up her end of the bargain would require her to incur a lethal dose of radiation, she bid her family adieu and made the repairs with the belief that she was sacrificing herself for them. The fact that she ended up ghoulified instead of dead was a surprise to be sure, but a welcome one. She usually avoided settlements, as in those days when the new world was young, all ghouls were viewed as monsters. Many communities had a shoot-on-sight policy for ghouls, and thus few were aware that some of them had retained their sentience, though they had lost their noses. Though she had managed to insinuate herself into a few communities by keeping her face covered, she was always eventually discovered, and exile was the merciful outcome of those interactions. Sometime around 2102 to 2103, she decided it was time to go home, and thus she returned to Appalachia. She saw Foundation from a distance and considered trying the old trick of wearing a mask, but decided against it. She wanted to find someplace safe, as ever since she had re-entered the region, she was being chased by something. She didn't know what it was, but she could tell from the trembling ground that it was massive. Hoping that the safe room in the old family estate would be enough to protect her, she returned to Brommel. When the mother load burst forth and revealed itself to be Penelope's unseen pursuer, she was indignant that the robot would dare enter her safe room without permission. She was also confused by the fact that it was speaking to her over the local speaker system. It seems that when her father had worked on the mother load, he hadn't thought it needed any means of speaking on its own. Having finally found a horn ride after a quarter century without direction, the Motherload asked for the location of its primary user, Daniel Hornwright. Penelope responded that her father had been gone for years, leading the Motherload to immediately request that Penelope accept authority over itself. A bit bewildered, Penelope took ownership of the Motherload. With one intruder dealt with, she turned to the Vault Dweller to figure out what they were doing in her home. The Vault Dweller explained their need for the Motherload as a means to drill into Vault 79. She agreed to help the Vault Dweller guide the Motherload into the vault, so long as the new society they were hoping to build would accept ghouls. They accepted this, and thus Penelope started planning. The main problem the mother load had was that it was difficult to direct to a specific location without placing a beacon there. This wouldn't work, as if they could place a beacon inside the vault, they wouldn't need the mother load. Penelope believed that she could coax the mother load in the right direction if she had two things, a custom pit boy and the schematic for a circuit she had helped design decades prior. With a plan starting to come together, the Vault Dweller departed for the first spot on their shopping list, Summersville. Here lay the house of the former grad student, Aaliyah, the primary designer of the circuit schematic Penelope requested. After wiping out the feral ghouls infesting the house, the Vault Dweller found the schematic in question within the basement workshop. With this in hand, they moved on to VTU to find a Pip-Boy construction kit. Though they had offered Penelope the use of their Pip-Boy, she needed one of her own as she was going to have to make some modifications to make it work as a mobile terminal for the mother load. Upon arriving at VTU, the Vault Dweller entered the same hidden wing they had visited with the Overseer when learning about the nature of Vault 79. 
Dodging an angry security assault run, the Vault Dweller grabbed the construction kit and shot out of the school as fast as their legs would carry them. Upon returning to Penelope in the safe room, the Vault Dweller learned that Penelope had added a voice synthesizer to the motherlode. No more would it have to be in range of a Hornwright speaker to be heard. Unfortunately, she had found significant damage when she was doing her work on the robotic drill. It needed new parts, specifically an interpolator, a sensor module, and an altimeter. As luck would have it, her estate was the perfect source for both the sensor and the altimeter, as there were iBots and an old Stingray jet there for each part respectively. As for the interpolator, the dweller would have to strip it from a robo-brain. Before departing to gather the required parts, they provided Penelope with a plan to salvage the existing altimeter with some Abraxo and a little elbow grease. With that, they headed back up the elevator. After dealing with a definitely not Bugthesda Dowd Assaultron and gathering a sensor module from the Hornred Estate, the Vault Dweller headed over the mountains to the Robco facility in Virginia. At the garage entrance to the site, they quickly dispatched a pair of robo-brains and collected the interpolator from one before turning back towards Brommel. Penelope took the requested parts from the Vault Dweller upon their return and promised to join them at Foundation once she had finished installing the parts and gathering a few things she needed from the estate. The Vault Dweller made their way back to Founders Hall, intent on bringing the good news of the Motherlode and its ghoul Shepherd that would soon be joining them at Foundation, only to discover that Dr. Hornred had beaten them there and was rapidly setting up a laboratory. With the Vault Dweller having succeeded in this initial effort, Paige was ready to start talking business. He explained that he'd been considering what to do about the laser grids when Jin, one of their scavengers, had come forward claiming to have a solution. Paige sent the Vault Dweller off to meet with Jin while he worked on the problem of what to do about the Vault's security turrets. All right, that should do it for this episode. When we come back for episode five, we'll join Jin in hunting down a piece of tech that will allow us to bypass the deadly laser grids in Vault 79. A special thank you to my patrons, and a thank you to all who came by to watch this video. This has been the Resolute Cartographer. I'll see you again next time.